It's hard to believe that Rare, a company that spent most of the last 10 years doing this, was once an actual, genuine, world-class game developer. But back on the N64, these guys were the king. They made so many great N64 titles that they were basically rivaled only by Nintendo themselves. GoldenEye, Diddy Kong Racing, Blast 4, Jet Force Gemini, Conker's Bad Fur Day, Perfect Dark. Then there's the ones that actually matter. Banjo-Kazooie is fucking amazing. This is a textbook example of a fun game. And Donkey Kong 64, having gone literally ape shit with the collectibles, is not far behind. But then Banjo-Tooie comes out of fucking nowhere and just wipes the floor with every single video game before it and every video game since. Possibly the dumbest thing that I hear non-stop even to this day is that sequels are never better than the original. I guess they never heard of Aliens, Terminator 2, Mario Land 2, Mario Galaxy 2, Mario Party 2, Star Fox 2, Star Fox 64, Sonic 2, Sonic 3, Resident Evil 4, Majora's Mask, Thousand Year Door, Yoshi's Island. The point is, if it's not too bold to say, is that everyone is stupid. Except me. Banjo-Tooie picks up two years after Banjo-Kazooie. Banjo, Kazooie, Bottles, and Mumbo are all gambling away their life savings when Grunty's sisters invade Spiral Mountain with a fucking tank. They then get Grunty out from under the boulder and find that she's now a skeleton. She then blows up Banjo's house and actually kills the shit out of Bottles. Banjo, Kazooie, and Mumbo set out to get revenge. That's right, give her a taste of Spiral Mountain street justice. Meanwhile, Grunty and her sisters have launched a sinister plot to steal the life force from people to give her a new body. I don't know why though, I honestly think she looks better this way. Right from the get-go, you have all the moves that you learned in Banjo-Kazooie. There's no bullshit where you have to relearn stuff. What they've done instead is just add a shitload of new abilities in addition to that. Turns out Bottles has a brother, Jam Jars, who's not only a drill sergeant that teaches you a billion things, but best of all, he's not dead, like Bottles, so he's useful. Some of the greatest moves are the grenade eggs, the first person shooter areas, shooting eggs while flying, but probably the best move in the game is the secret move where you hit people over the head with Kazooie. Then there's the highlight of the game which is the ability to split up Banjo and Kazooie to become their own individual characters. They get a whole bunch of new moves that only they can do when they're on their own. Banjo can pull his backpack over his head and swim in radioactive water because apparently his backpack is made of flex tape. Kazooie can teabag people or whatever the female equivalent of that is. What really separates Banjo-Tooie from Banjo-Kazooie and a lot of other games for that matter is how often the game allows you multiple ways to tackle things. Whether intentional or not, by putting so many different moves into the game, the developers have given the player an inordinate number of options. Take this Jiggy for example. What you're supposed to do is fly over there with Kazooie and then fight a bunch of sentry drones. But alternatively, you can launch a clockwork egg over there and have clockwork Kazooie trip the alarm and then take out the sentries from a distance with zero risk to yourself. Jolly's Bar, you can pay him two doubloons to open the spare room, or you can just destroy the door and walk in. Then there's this part with this pitch black room where you're supposed to split up and have one character stand on a light switch and the other cross the lighted path. But instead, you can just light the path by shooting fire eggs. Then there's the really broken techniques, like the thing where Banjo on his own can swing his backpack which gives him a double jump. Yeah, it's a glitch, but it makes for some pretty crazy tech. Speaking of which, Banjo-Tooie speedruns are nuts. I don't even want to know how many hours have gone into finding the optimal techniques and routes for beating this game. They even found an obscure glitch where you can skip to the final boss. Banjo-Tooie is honestly broken. The second thing that puts this game well above Banjo-Kazooie is the levels. The size of them has increased dramatically, they're absolutely massive. You'd think that would make the game feel very sparse in comparison to Banjo-Kazooie, but surprisingly, it keeps up quite well. Because of the additional intricacies that this game introduces to the Banjo-Kazooie formula, the game has a lot of variety in gameplay and the level design is built to complement it, naturally. Every level also has a boss battle, and it's not like a stupid little throwaway fight, it's a full on boss. How about a few nuts and bull- NO! Every level also has a transformation, but unlike Banjo-Kazooie where you play as a defenseless piece of shit, 
You get to be a washing machine, or an armored car, or a fucking T-Rex. You can even be a bee, and not a shitty bee like the original. You can actually shoot stingers. The transformations are done by Humba Wumba, a new character who's the best shaman in the entire game. Yeah, apparently Mumbo's getting rusty, but he still has an important role. In each level, he has a different magical ability, like possessing a giant statue, lifting big objects. No, yeah, he's useless. He can barely even jump. But hey, in the fifth level, he has a spell that enlarges things. I have to wonder if he did a spell on Wumba's tits. But you know what's really the tits? Get this. Every level in the game is connected to another. Every level has a passageway or a tunnel to a different level. And this is used to really great effect. Like this part, where you swim through this underwater pathway in Jolly Roger's Lagoon, and it leads to Glitter Gulch Mine where you get a Jinjo. Probably the single best example of how interconnected this game is would be this one Jiggy. So in Jolly Roger's Lagoon, there's these three pigs who want to go for a swim. Unfortunately, the water is being flooded with toxic waste. So toxic, in fact, that it made this guy get a horrible mutated third arm. Yo, why don't you just take another dip? Then you could cosplay Goro from Mortal Kombat. So you go into the pipe that's dumping it, which leads you to Grunty Industries. It's here that you press a switch to stop the toxic waste dump. But now that you did that, it turns out the water is too cold. So you go to Hail Fire Peaks where you press a switch to dump hot water in there. But it turns out that that water is way too hot. So you go up to heaven and kick a fucking ice cube off the cliff into the boiling water where he gets incinerated and simultaneously cools the water down so it's just hot enough. Then you go back to Hailfire and dump the water in the pool. That was all one jiggy and it took you like halfway across the universe. It's this aspect of the game that gives it an immense sense of realism and unity. I've never seen another game do this. I'm sure there is one but the fact is it's pretty uncommon. It's really ahead of its time, and something that I'd like to see more of. One of the greatest things about Banjo-Kazooie was that even though the levels were huge, they had such a variance in scenery and landmarks that it made it easy to navigate. You could take these massive levels and partition them in your head. Take Bubble Gloop Swamp, big level, but in your head you could break it down into the area with the turtle, the area with the crocodile head, the area with the egg, divide and conquer as they say. Banjo-Tooie is also pretty good about this, for the most part. Naturally, bigger levels are more difficult to navigate in general, but Banjo-Tooie still manages to maintain the variance in level design enough to allow you to divide and conquer for the most part. But some levels make this very difficult. Pterodactyl Land is probably the worst offender. So many parts of this stupid ass level look exactly the same. This is probably the biggest issue with the level design and possibly the game's biggest flaw. But the next biggest flaw has got to be the interruptions. Too often the game plays a cutscene for things that don't necessarily warrant one. I think the idea was to make sure nobody got confused if doing something on one end of the massive world changes something on the other end. But it can be a little bit frustrating. But if that's the case, then sometimes they're justified. One of the complaints I hear a lot about this game is the backtracking. It's absolutely true, there is a lot of backtracking in this game, but I never really got why that was such a big deal. For one thing, the game has a fast travel system that actually works, unlike Donkey Kong 6 before, making it easier and quicker to get around, which makes backtracking much less monotonous. And on the other hand, I never really understood why backtracking in general was such a burden. I always thought of it as rewarding, coming across something in one level that you're obviously not prepared for, and then coming back to it when you are, is something that I always found satisfying. I think it probably hits harder for a lot of Banjo-Kazooie fans because of the comparatively brisk pace at which the original game tends to move. This change of pace might seem a bit jarring if you went to Banjo-Tooie immediately after finishing Kazooie, but I see it as a welcome change. It certainly makes the game more challenging than the original. Another complaint I often hear is that the game doesn't possess the charm of the original. Now, I don't think it's a stretch to say that a game that starts out with bottles being murdered is tonally darker than Banjo-Kazooie, but I don't necessarily find that to be a bad thing either. The game is still funny as hell. Kazooie is a lot more cynical now, which is hilarious. She even cracks a joke about how lame Bottles is the second after he dies. The game is also full of dirty jokes. Remember Jolly and his partner, Mary Maggie? It's grab a sailor night every Wednesday. It's very popular. One doubloon gets you five tankards of Seaman's brew- Oh, eh, eh. Look at the menu. Toad in the hole. You gotta buy me dinner before that. Seaman surprise- Oh, ugh. Even I think that's gay. Uh, I mean... 
Lord Wu Fuck Fuck. That's funny. Apparently the idea for this guy's name comes from one of the game's programmers who would always be at his desk going fuck 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 whenever he encountered a problem. Yeah, programming is hard. Anyway, the original point I'm trying to make is that the game's charm might not be exactly as lighthearted and happy as Banjo-Kazooie, but the direction that it does follow works more than well enough. And it's not like the game is a downer by any means. Just because Banjo doesn't hop up and down like an idiot whenever he gets a jiggy does not mean that he's clinically depressed. And just because Bottles is dead does not mean that it's the end of the world. I mean, he wasn't the favorite character in Banjo-Kazooie anyway, right? Banjo-Tooie's presentation is top-notch. Banjo-Kazooie is already a very good-looking game in its own right. It's technically dated, but aesthetically very pleasing to the eye. Banjo-Tooie turned the graphics way up, the textures are sharper, the environments are more detailed, there's crazy good lighting effects, the game looks amazing. It's probably one of the best looking games on the Nintendo 64, rivaled only by Rare's other games. Naturally, this causes frame rate issues on original hardware, which is crazy. Low frame rate on the N64? What is this, fucking Narnia? Banjo-Tooie's soundtrack is masterful. In Banjo-Kazooie, most of the levels had a very upbeat tune to them, which suits the game's quicker pacing. Banjo-Tooie, on the other hand, tends to have a more atmospheric soundtrack, which fits this game much better. Banjo-Tooie is the kind of game that wants you to appreciate and absorb your surroundings, and its soundtrack gives off the vibes of a grand adventure instead of just simply a game. Of course, like Banjo-Kazooie, the music also does that awesome thing where it changes to suit which part of the level you're in. I wish games did that more often. When it comes to N64 games, I think the only thing stopping Banjo-Tooie from being the clear winner is the fact that Majora's Mask is there too. But I think that the most important thing to keep in mind is that I have no idea how to end this video.